So uh, my name is Kevin Geiger. I'm the director of planning at the Two Rivers Atacuichi Regional Commission. And you are at the second forum. Tonight, we're going to talk about uh, zoning tools. We're not going to apply them, but we're going to talk about all the different tools um, that can be used to help Recording further. Recording in progress. Oh, there's, there's more. OK, so now uh, you got to click the got it part. Uh, uh, tools to help further housing that's affordable in your town, in your regulations. And uh, we're going to go around real quick and just say who you are, what town you are, maybe your role. Um, and so I'll call on you because it's always awkward. And so first, uh, Stephen from our shop. Yeah, good to see everyone again. Uh, Stephen Bauer, senior planner at Two Rivers. Great. And Gregory Colling. Hi, I'm Greg Colling with um, the Stratton Planning Commission. Thanks. Uh, Trevor. Trevor Lashua, I'm the town manager in Randolph. And Ann Reynolds. From the town of Pomfort Planning Commission and trying to figure out what to do in Little Pomfort. Thanks. <laughs> uh, J John Hafner. Uh, John Hafner, uh, uh, Housing and Transportation Program Manager at Vital Communities. Rick Benson. Rick Benson, uh, Bethel Planning Commission. Great. And Sandy Haas. Uh, Sandy Haas, Rochester Planning Commission. Matt Osborne. Hi, Matt Osborne. I'm a planner with the town of Hartford. Thanks, Matt. Sally Miller. Hi, Sally Miller. I'm on the Woodstock Planning Commission. And Lee Shen. Lee Shen, uh, Thetford Select Board, and liaison to the Thetford Planning Commission. Thanks. Uh, John Reed. Yes, I'm with the uh, Hartford Planning Commission. Okay. Jamaica. Hi, I'm Jamaica Kelly, and I am from Randolph, and I'm covering this for the Randolph, the White River Herald. Thanks. Sean, uh, I can't, I don't know if I could say your last name, Sean. Uh, Sean McGranigan. I'm the uh, Ordinance Administrator and Planner in Harland. Okay, McGranigan. Very good. Chris Brimmer. Yeah, I'm the uh, Zoning, Planning, and Economic Development Administrator for the Town of Fairley. Good to see you, Chris. Uh, John Heath. I'm on the Hartford Planning Commission. Great. Colin Butler. Good evening. I'm Colin Butler. I'm on the Hartford Planning Commission as well. Thanks. Mary Bryant. Bedford Select Board and Liaison to the Housing Committee. Wonderful. DC Forbes. I'm David Forbes, uh, Chair of the Thetford Planning Commission. Uh, Orca Media, Media, can you identify yourself? Whoever shows up as Orca Media. Otherwise, Stephen will zap you. Mm. <laughs> we'll have to see. I think they're just recording it. Oh, it. maybe they're just recording it. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Bruce Riddle. Uh, Town of Harvard Planning Commission. Hi, Bruce. Anna. Hi, I live in White River Junction and I work for Vital Communities. Oh, good. Kathy. Hi, Kathy Melisic, historic Wilder, Vermont resident. Very good. Uh, Zoe Cartwright. Hi there, I'm Zoe. I'm um, on the Town of Bethel Planning Commission. Excellent. And Allie, is that how you say it, Allie? Yes, Allie Tough Engine. It's pronounced like a tough engine, and I'm a member of the Hartford Select Board. Tough Engine, Tough Engine. Okay, very good. Uh, great, good to see you all here. Uh, make sure it's the right meeting. Uh, we're going to talk about, uh, in particular, the work going forward with the seven towns, uh, which are all of you and stuff. We're not working with Pomfret, but that's okay. Pomfret, any town is welcome to kind of watch us do this thing um, and kind of glean what they can from it. And just to recap for those seven towns, tonight we're going to kind of be talking about a bunch of the tools of the trade uh, in terms of working on zoning. And then we're actually going to work on each of your zonings uh, at various times over the next year or so and come out with uh, a series of targeted recommendations. As, as I say, 
it's likely to end up like maybe a hundred words. It's not necessarily going to be a lot of stuff, um, but a lot of important little tweaks to your zoning. And we're going to be looking at zoning bylaws in particular. And, uh, and then hopefully all the towns will adopt those things, like these split, which will be great. And so I'm going to share my screen. Uh, and as I do it, Stephen, you want to uh, just kind of run everybody through the, the Zoom protocol stuff? First off, you want to speak, unmute yourself. Um, but if everyone on the, on the bottom doesn't know where the reactions are to, uh, to put your hand up, there's actually a hand raise function. Um, if you, so if you go down to share screen and over to the right, you'll see reactions. And then at the bottom of that, you'll raise your hand like that. And then once you're done, you'll just lower your hand. I'll try and lower people's hands as we go through, but that's kind of how we queue up for, for questions and answers. And, and, uh, if you have questions, uh, while Kevin's in the middle of something, um, and you want to kind of ask the question, but wait, you can put it in the chat that's on the right side and I will follow that. Thank you. I kind of have to do something here because you all went away and so I couldn't see anybody here. So hopefully, oh, I still can't see you. So tonight, for whatever reason on Zoom, um, I can see the slides. Uh, can you see my slide? No. No, we don't see your oh. Please don't. Okay. I hang cannot. On. Hang on a second here. Do, 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 do. Just fix that. Pink. Kevin, I just switched you to the main host. Maybe. Okay. I thought we had we thought we had that before, but that's okay. Can you see my slide now? Yes. Okay, good. Everything's everything's working again. Wonderful. Um, so as Stephen said, uh, just keep yourself on mute. You can raise hand, use the raise hand uh, reaction thing down bottom. Stop us at any time. Uh, we have more to cover tonight in some ways than we had last night. So there's lots of little pieces. Um, I forget, because I've been doing this a long time, that not all this stuff is obvious. And some of it's downright arcane. So um, if if I use an acronym or something strikes your fancy, stop us and we'll, we'll talk about it. But uh, we're here tonight to talk specifically about zoning standards and the processes um, there that act as obstacles. And so we're gonna, I'm gonna talk about each of these in specific as we go along, but these are a bunch of standards that we see in zoning bylaws. Um, and we're gonna run through each of these and talk about suggested ways to be dealing with them somewhat. And then we're also gonna talk about the stand, the processes that we go. One of which uh, is the easiest is maybe don't regulate it at all. And then you know, it's easy for you, easy for them, but the approvals that you go through and appeals. And um, we'll also talk about, uh, we won't talk about just straight permits so much, but we will um, remind me if I forget the alternate approval process where the zoning administrator can act as the appropriate municipal panel, because that can be a little bit easier on people. And so now we're going to just go through each of the standards and why you have them and what you need to do with them. And uh, we have parking requirements out there. Most towns have them. Some towns don't have them in the more rural areas, uh, but in general, we're not gonna be dealing a lot uh, with your zoning standards in rural areas, unless we see a real glaring thing because that's not where most of the housing is going on. And it's usually not where most of the housing is restricted um, in terms of what could logically be built, be built there. But there are some things uh, that we may see out in your rural areas where we go, okay, you know, we can can fiddle with something there. But in general, uh, as uh, for those of you who were here last night, we're looking at smaller and smaller households out there. They have less people, um, and so they don't need a lot of cars. And so, in general, what we're going to be doing is, if we see a parking standard, is to say, how about one parking place per house unit out there? Um, where you're in a downtown or other more built up area, 
we may be looking at off-site stuff or shared use. Is there, a, are there public spaces nearby? Is there on-street parking nearby? And uh, shared uses in particular come up more in site plan approval or in conditional use approval, where the standard could be like, oh, you're a bank, you're a nightclub, don't need to have this, each of you make parking, off you go. Uh, same thing, you know, uh, housing and dentist office. Well, when you're at the dentist, you're not at your house. Yeah, you know, that type of thing. So, so those things can often share parking in between them, saves everybody some money, saves the world some asphalt. And the other thing um, is, especially in more dense areas, looking at connections, requiring connections between especially commercial establishments. I was just on the road out in Denver and stuff, and I can't tell you how many times I had to drive into some place and then drive back out to drive to the next place I could see, but there was a berm, a fence, a something, so I couldn't actually walk from one place to the other place to the other place. And, and there are ways to do that, even when they're not built yet. And so when we can, we'll, we'll get people to walk places. And that fits in sidewalks and parking, uh, sidewalks and um, pedestrian connections fit in with parking because if you move people around, they don't have to jump to the next parking spot. Lot size. Uh, this is a little aerial view of Woodstock, just so you know. Uh, Woodstock in its uh, core area has an 8,000 square foot lot size, a fifth of an acre or so. Pretty small, but works perfectly fine. And, and people, you know, aren't driving through going, oh my God, look at that thing. They're driving through going, oh my God, look at that thing. Uh, that's what they do in Woodstock, right? So we're going to talk about lot size. We're also going to talk about uh, lot size per unit. And so that's the type of thing where you may say, okay, you know, you, you only need a, a, a quarter acre or in Woodstock, you only need a fifth of an acre per unit. But now all of a sudden we have two units. Do you need a tenth of an acre? And, and does it keep going up like that? Or really, a lot of these houses are potentially four units. So does a quarter acre or a fifth of an acre here still work? And some of that may be um, for the places with good sewer and water. We say it doesn't matter how many units. It, what, it, what we care about more is the shape and the size and the setbacks and, and other things there. But if it looks like one of these houses in the picture, if you want to fit 12 in there, maybe that's fine. Uh, why worry when we have no need to worry about sewage treatment? If you do have sewage or water constraints, um, like your systems are maxed out, th those are real things. Um, and then we're going to look at, at rural areas for that don't have public sewer and water, they have septic stuff. And in general, we're going to be looking at one acre out there for where you want moderately dense development. Uh, you don't need a lot more than one acre, but there are ways to keep one acre lots from just stacking all the way. And we do that through density where we may say, oh, it's a, you can go to a one acre lot, but you can use a five acre or 10 acre density. And so doesn't mean you get houses every acre because they have to have those other lands involved, but there are ways to do that um, and keep the density, that rural feel out in your back roads um, still light, but not having everybody have to buy 10 acres. Pretty easy fixes along the way there. And this is just a graphic to show you an example of, of what different densities look like from uh, six dwelling units on uh, 0.3 acres, which is actually 20 units per acre, to the middle one, which is 12 units per acre, to the top seven units per acre, and to the bottom right, five units per acre. Uh, just to give you kind of that bird's eye view to say when we're talking, 20 units even. We're not necessarily talking wall-to-wall -wall building at all. And um, as brought up last night, uh, you, you may want to look at having minimums out there. So just because that's a, you know, one dwelling unit on the right lower right corner there, you can see, well, that could be three. But just because you allow three doesn't mean somebody's going to build three. Maybe somebody just comes in and builds one. Uh, and so maybe instead of saying just the maximum, you also want to say the minimum, say you can't just come in and build one because you can build three there. We're trying to 
get more units in where we need them. That's very much the same size as the unit on the left, which is actually six. And these are some visuals. Oh, let's see if this actually works. Um, this is a shot of Wilder, historic Wilder. Kathy's here from Wilder. Um, and so the, actually this is right uh, maybe in Kathy's neck of the woods. This is like Fern Street and, and that uh, area by the post office. That's the post office, on the left there, Route 5 on the right. But if I, let's see if I do something here. Yes, aha, it worked. Um, that's just to show you they're not the same picture. It's not immediately obvious. All of those units that are circled in yellow on the right are either put into the picture or are repurposed. And so uh, we have like a six unit out by the road. We've got a five unit in the back there. We've got a little accessory dwelling unit behind the house. And we have an existing garage that we turned into accessory dwelling in. So just on that one edge of a neighborhood, we've made essentially a dozen units. And to the average person, looking at those pictures or driving by, there's nothing that jumps out and says, oh my gosh, they just did a bunch of housing. And that's where we wanna be in lots of places. So we, we can fit it to community values, to mass and scale. And there's ways we can talk about that so that the things that we love about the place are kept as we go forward. But lots and lots of room out there. There's room in Wilder, there's room in Rochester, there's room in, even in Woodstock, um, there's not as much room, but there's room in Woodstock, and there's certainly room in Bethel, places like that, where we can look and go, there's actually lots of spots to do some of this. And some of these existing structures are also single family homes that may be uh, barely occupied. Uh, I think Lee mentioned last night, you know, there are a lot of houses that just have one person left in them, a lot of house for one person maybe we can make it advantageous to, to break that up and put more units inside the same box. Height and setbacks. We don't deal with height too much, but you may want to look at your maximum height level. You may want to look at a minimum height level. You may want to say, this is not where we want one story flat construction. We want you to be going up. You know, you may be next to a downtown that's got three-story brick structures and go, well, we want us three-story brick structures here. Um, it is a way to limit density. You do want to talk to your fire department and, and not go too, too high, make sure they, they can do that. And you don't want to get into a uh, shading adjacent property. Sometimes if it is a small neighborhood of smaller houses, one big house in there uh, would really feel out of place. Setbacks are the distance, uh, front setbacks, of course, are distance from lot lines and side setbacks and rear setbacks also distant from lot lines. And there's, we, when we're in there, that's one of the little uh, kind of peeves of mine sometimes is I'll look at setbacks and I'll go, oh, that's, that's not a very good definition because how do you measure from the edge of the lot line to the building? Is it the building wall? Is it the building drip edge? Is it the edge of the material? Um, and sometimes it's not clear. So we, we may fiddle around with that, or you may have had issues and say, you know what? We're always trying to figure out where the edge of our setback is. Um, oftentimes in the village though, you don't need a lot of front setback and historically you don't have a lot of front setback. So if all the houses are you know five feet off the sidewalk, why make the new person build 20 feet off the sidewalk? Pull them up to there. Uh, and side bet setbacks uh, can, and even rear setbacks can go down as low as zero um, when you're just building wall to wall buildings like you are in some of our downtowns. And here's just a schematic for those um, folks who need a little bit of picture to go the setbacks form that box which you can build. And we think about measuring uh, front setbacks from the road lot line, the, the center line, because um, it's always findable. A lot of times setbacks are from the right of way, but often the right of way is an unknown critter out there and, and can take you a lot of time to, to actually find it. Types of housing. This is actually my house, my town. This is Harding Place in, in Pomfret. Uh, and there are several units in here in kind of what looks like an old extended kind of farm compound. But uh, single families are out there, of course, 
thing, single families aren't bad in and of themselves, um, but every single family gets to have an accessory dwelling unit, an extra apartment, however you want to think of that out there in Vermont law right now. Um, and I think we need to do maybe a better job explaining that to the general public and showing them how they can do that. But everybody gets to do an ADU, which can be inside, attached, or detached in Vermont. Not everybody gets to do a duplex, but in most of our towns, um, the zoning is the same for one or two family houses. Um, one of the things I think we want to look at is condominiumized houses or ADUs. So um, if there's an existing house and it's a big house and it's existing, maybe there's duplexes allowed in that district, but maybe we want to say, but you can do a triplex in there if you can cut up that existing house. Um, we just don't want a certain size master six scale. Maybe we want to allow the condominiumization of the ADU, meaning I can build an ADU on my lot and I can actually sell it or I could move into it and sell my house. Um, there are issues there around setbacks and lot sizes and stuff, but that may be more useful and it may fit one's a particular situation more than actually just renting something out there. Then we have triplexes, quads, and multifamily. Most of our towns define multifamily up to five, uh, but it's what it, there's no definition you know, set by um, statute or anything. You can figure out what you want to be as your multifamily limit. Uh, and then we have apartment buildings, which are often defined slightly differently. Um, and again, you might say, well, we're good, you know, for mass and scale purposes, we're good at 10 or 20 or something out there, but we just don't, we don't want a hundred unit apartment building. And if you want to build a hundred units, you're just going to build five twenties, break it up a little bit, something like that. Obviously those are only taking place uh, where we have sewer and water. Then all of these other things, some of which uh, we hit upon last night, some of which are basically can also be just defined as this means the same thing as a single family house. So a tiny home is just a tiny home. Um, it isn't necessarily have to be treated any differently than a house. But does it have a foundation or is it on wheels? That may be a distinction. Maybe we want to allow more tiny homes. And so instead of building a four bedroom house, we allow four one bedroom tiny homes on the lot. Um, have less mass and scale, they're all small, can fit on there, same exact septic system going out the door. Uh, maybe we wanna look at that. Boarding houses, an old use, not commonly um, street permitted in, in zoning, but that's, it's not a hotel, it's not an inn. Uh, it's long-term housing where you kind of go downstairs and get your meals, that type of thing. Certainly appropriate for lots of people. A bungalow court, uh, actually, I think that even got mentioned in the paper today. For those of you who read the Valley News, they were talking about work that Lebanon may do to allow more kinds of housing. And the bungalow court, which is that older style of a bunch of small homes, kind of are usually around a, a central little green, uh, which is very similar to what's known as horizontal apartments, where a developer, instead of building a box that has a bunch of apartments, they build what we would think of as a subdivision, but they treat it like an apartment building. They manage it, except you own or you rent a little house versus part of a big building. Uh, it's just kind of deconstructed uh, for those of you who watch all those cooking shows like I do. Short-term rentals. Uh, I want to go on about that a little bit. They are not inherently evil, um, but they can do things to your town that you don't want to have happen. They can provide housing. They can be turned into permanent housing pretty easily, but they can also suck up the air that you're trying to create affordable housing with by people um, turning potential lots or potential houses into just short-term rentals that aren't doing anything for existing residents um, and for the workers you want. On the other hand, maybe your existing residents, you know, they just wanna go on vacation and they just wanna rent their house for two weeks as a short-term rental. That might be a great way to have a bunch of residents, um, help them pay for whatever. Uh, and so how you wanna craft those things 
is important. Is it the number of units? Is it the size? Is it the neighborhood? Is it the how much you can rent it part of life? All of those things uh, get into short-term rentals. Mobile homes are protected in Vermont. You can't uh, regulate mobile homes out of existence as are mobile home parks. Uh, and they're a very affordable option for a lot of people. So we'll, we wanna look in there, your standards around mobile homes, mobile home parks. Um, and modular homes are the same thing. Modular homes are just another way to build a home. They're not a mobile home, um, but Vermods were brought up last night and there are Vermods that are similar in shape and size to some mobile homes. And so maybe when we're talking about mobile home parks, we also want to allow modular or stick-built structures in those mobile home parks so they can enjoy the perks that mobile home parks have in terms of kind of more dense than regular, um, but they're not a mobile home. Co-housing. Uh, we don't have a lot of co-housing. Uh, probably the biggest co-housing project in the region is uh, Cobb Hill down in Heartland which doesn't have zoning, um, but there you're, you're talking kind of uh, an amalgamation of different stuff um, stuck together. And so your rules are gonna wanna allow that up to maybe a certain scale. Maybe you go, eh, you can do that, but it's 10 units or 15 units, or 20 units. Um, but if you can all make it look like a barn and a couple of farmhouses have at it. Uh, we've talked to about campgrounds uh, as, as kind of a stopgap measure, potentially, to deal with affordability and especially homelessness. Uh, do we want to allow people to build uh, campgrounds in some way, shape, or form so that they can, you can put up a bunch of small housing units, even if temporary, uh, to help us deal with what we have? And then dorms. We have dorms in places, um, but you can build a dorm as a housing type of situation. And, they, and there are others out there, I'm sure, beyond this. This just gives you an example of accessory dwelling units. Uh, the, the law in Vermont actually changed uh, a couple of years ago because you used to have an accessory dwelling unit was an owner-occupied house and you could build the ADU next to the house, like on the far um, left over there. But maybe you don't want to do that. Maybe you want to do more of the far right. You want to move into the ADU and rent the house out there. And that's now perfectly allowed. Uh, the, the law in Vermont now that um, preempts local zoning and just says everybody gets ADUs is, uh, is just that the lot is owner occupied. So the owner can live in either of the structures. And then the law around ADUs also allows you to loosen up things as much as you want. So you can say, well, we don't care if the owner lives in either. Um, we don't care that you just have one. Everybody gets two ADUs. You can keep going however you want to go, but there is a minimum floor um, set by the law. And it's not used very much. And that's, again, one of the things that's not really a zoning thing. It may be more an outreach thing. It may be more explaining to people this is actually how our bylaw now works. Just so you all know, you can make an apartment and come see me and get a permit for that type of thing. Uh, many of our bylaws have some type of incentives around this. Um, so that's typically done through a waiver process, um, you know, not a variance process and not a special exemption process because there's no such thing as a special exemption process in Vermont. You can get a variance in Vermont, but that is a, uh, a five-part mandatory test. It's a very difficult to get. I always joke that you should get a variance about as often as you get struck by lightning, um, which hopefully isn't often. Uh, but it's a variance is difficult, whereas a waiver is only for dimensional requirements. And you just give yourself the rule. You have to put a, a rule about how you're gonna do that. Hello. Oh, who's that there? Oh, uh, you John, there we go. Um, 
but a waiver can be around lot size, can be around density and stuff. And you that can be a perk. So if you say, oh, if you're going to do an affordable unit, however you define that, you might not pick the standard affordability HUD guidelines. You might say, well, you know, you can be um, up, up to this price range or up to you know this rent. Uh, we'll we'll give you extra house out there. Um, Don Graham, I don't know if I see tonight. Don Don mentioned planned unit developments. Uh, several of our towns have planned unit development or PUD provisions. Planned unit developments. The way you can think about that is is number one, they're not just one structure. That doesn't make any sense. Um, there's many structures out there and you're going to move them around on the lot in a way that you usually wouldn't in order usually to cluster things. So it's it can be thought of like a conservation subdivision in some ways. Um, but the difference between a planned unit development and often subdivisions is you don't need to subdivide. The, the person, the developer can still own all of the structures and hasn't subdivided the lots and they get all done. It's one of the things that I'm I'm ambivalent about, um, not about the the effects or the 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 goals of that, but I'm not so sure that sometimes we can't do it through just a waiver provision. Inclusionary zoning is allowed in Vermont, and uh, you can do that through fees or uh, mandatory requirements on affordability. So you could say if you're going to build ten, the tenth one is affordable. Uh, or you pay a certain amount of money and stuff. It helps to have development pressure on places to be able to say, we're, you know, we're going to make you do this. Um, Burlington has inclusionary zoning and a few other places in Vermont. I don't believe anybody down here does, has an inclusionary zoning requirement. But it's a pretty good idea. Usually only um, applied to larger projects. And then somebody mentioned form-based review last night. Uh, form-based code or form-based review is not something we're gonna do a lot of in this particular project, uh, just because it's a pretty heavy duty uh, revamp of your bylaw and it takes a lot of visual work. Um, but I do think that we should be able to, to do kind of a, a, a low budget, easy form-based code, mainly where we're getting away from numbers of units and getting more into shape, mass, and scale. So where we have a picture and say more, if you want to build that, we really don't care how many people are inside of that when you get all said and done um, up to a certain point. There are things with people, you know, that's where parking and, and other things come in. And you may want to say, well, you know, there's a certain amount of parking or noise or lighting or, or landscaping or whatever, um, where we're going to, we're going to constrain that box. But, but oftentimes, um, for neighbors, and for the general public, what they really care about is what it's going to look like when things get done. And so form based codes can have are a way to attack that. Those are all standards. I'm going to stop there for a sec. Um, Stephen has, can see all of you and the chat and stuff and see if there's questions out there. And I see Lori right away. And so, Stephen, you can, I can only see like four people on my little screen. So, so you just kind of figure out who's going to be next. But uh, Lori, what do you got? Well, I just wanted to offer something up a little bit, and, and this goes to the form-based code stuff that you're talking about. And we're right in the middle of looking at doing zoning changes to increase residential, you may know the IC district and stuff like that. So we were having this conversation the other night and there's other members of the commission, planning commission that are here that might want to chime in. Um, and, you know, I was talking just about the same kind of stuff that you were talking about that we're sort of in this quasi using the concepts of forming it. So obviously we're looking at floor area ratio is one of the things which is the mechanism to say, hey, we don't care how many units you do, um, you'll go at, you know, we're saying X number of square feet can be dedicated towards residential. Mm -hmm. And now we're looking more at the envelope of what we want to do. And we're looking at putting it within the context of the objective of the zoning district. 
So using that as our way of shaping it, Mm. but anything, you know, I don't know how others have been thinking about it because it is, it is the form base is something that we're trying to achieve in similar manner of what you're doing. But I'd be interested to see how other communities might be thinking about it if they are, because we're right in the crux of that process right now. And we're trying to figure out what's the right ratio of square footage to allocate towards uh, residential. It's in a different zoning district. We already have FAR in our downtown district, but I just be interested in other thoughts that people may have at this juncture to, to help us get thinking more about it. Oh, okay. Um, I, I don't know if, if anybody wants to speak to that in particular, um, kind of let us know. Uh, I think you may be leading the pack in, in the region on, on that particular thing, Lori, as far as I know, uh, out there with what's going on with our towns. We, we do tend to be doing that sometimes, but which, which, okay. Which is, which is okay. Um, so I think okay. Kathy, Kathy next, Steve, is that right? Yep, Kathy, then Lee. Okay. Hey, this is Kathy Malisic from Wilder. Hey, Lori. <laughs> um, Hi. So the, um, I'm curious, can you pop up that Wilder slide again? Because oh, um, oh yeah, kind of related to what I think you're saying with form-based zoning. Mm -hmm. Okay. So yes, I live about a block away from all this. Okay. And you can see we're generally pretty compact. And it's interesting. Some of the circles that you've put in are things that where I've asked people, hey, wouldn't it be great to talk infill here? Mm -hmm. So if you look at the picture on the right, the circle that's on the far right, yeah, that's a huge, you know, where you have a two-story put in, that's a huge empty lot that I believe belongs to the house just to its, well, it's, it's north in real yep. life, just yep. to the bottom right there. Um, yep. The lowest circle there, the garage, um, I believe that that house and property, I think, don't quote me on this, but I think that's the one that no longer looks exactly like that. It was a historic house that I believe has been switched over to an incredibly standard looking cape that does not fit in with the contributing historic structures. Um, I, and to be clear, I'm all for infill and smart use of this. Um, when you have a historic district, as you can see with a lot of these planned worker houses on here, I would look to something like I think is possible with form-based zoning for you know, seeing that it fits in, we're generally on one tenth and two tenth acre lots around here. So mm -hmm. it's not, you know, my neighbor lives in a tiny house in a one tenth acre, not a tiny house, tiny house, like a legit small old house and um, raised three kids in there with a one tenth acre lot. Um, the, as a, as an interesting thing, the biggest circle that you have kind of in the center, mm -hmm. That's actually a parking lot that is used for the house that's all kind of built up just above that across the side street. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, there's a parking lot kind of near the road. Yeah, um, it, well, it's, a, it's just a parking lot behind right between, here. you know, behind what used to be our post office and all. And, you know, it seems like kind of a waste because the house itself does have a large lot around it. Um, and it is that house that's just above it, which was converted into um, like kind of rehab departments yep. over time. So one thing that I look at, instead of just going to a zoning meeting and, you know, people, and I wish we had some zoning people from Hartford on here. I don't think I saw any from the commit, from the ZBA. Um, but one thing that I would look at is, yeah, can we really, I think it would be more helpful with a lot of this stuff to have more site visits to talk about, you know, settlement patterns, the way they exist more than they are now. Um, it's, I go to a lot of the meetings and you just hear, oh, there's this square footage and there's this and there's the setback and all. And then you look at it and you're like, wow, that might fit the numbers, but it doesn't at all pass the smell test when you look at the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. So, um, so yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm intrigued by this form-based zoning, even though it does sound like it is more of a hall work-wise that, that it is um once you get it though it's not so much of a haul but but doing the transition from what you have to that is, is, is lori knows i'm always happy to help with whatever i can <laughs> okay ali oh hi there um i have a very different kind of question it was it sort of related to there was a slide way back <laughs> 
that I, is not up anymore that you had all these different uh, kinds of situations with different lot sizes and at the very bottom you said well rural lots where there's no town sewer oh, no yep. town water you basically um advised or recommended or at least said that one acre lots are suitable well in thetford nobody has town water or town sewer there's some private water companies but there are lots of areas where the, where in villages, people have somehow managed to have lots that are much smaller. And we are reviewing our water systems now. I don't know what, you know, eventually we're going to hire a consultant. Um, but there is some dense development that, you know, some people pipe their water from a long way away from a spring and then have a cistern. Uh, and I know the state doesn't really like that, but there's no law against it unless you're... Um, the number of people exceeds 10 i think right so yeah there are, yeah I, I see you say increases likelihood for on site i mean i i would like to see, and and then what about um a multi unit thing in a rural area would yeah it yeah it's um one of the things uh one of the kind of kind of you know thing is it's attention is a lot of rural areas people like a certain uh level of density of development they just certain like a certain feel and but every now and then like in, in my town we have a very large uh big old farmhouse up the road here and if someone were to go and propose eight of those farmhouses i think people would just freak but that farmhouse exists uh, and so one of the things in rural areas that I think we'll be looking at is what we call an adaptive reuse provision, which is if you have an existing big house or a barn, or maybe it's even an old industrial structure out there, uh, not that people can build new ones because that level of scale you don't want necessarily out there, but um, the, the big house up the road here for me could easily have eight units in it. Um, if, and if you included the barn, you could have a lot more. That's where uh, you could do potentially an on-site system that works. Uh, Chris Brimmer is here from Fairley. They're looking, they don't have, they have water, but they don't have sewer. And, uh, and the water doesn't go all over the town, but they're looking at some specific sites where maybe they could, and they have good soils, maybe they could build essentially communal joint um, you know, septic fields that, that would serve, maybe it serves that house and three more houses that they build. Maybe it's the one field across the way um, and, you know, you connect several to it. A, a bunch of our villages you could not build now with permitting safely. That's, that's different than like whether you want to do it aesthetically. It's just a mystery um, where the water and sewer goes, but it's, it's the way that they are. And they can keep going under what we call a what about, best fit. There was somebody in the last meeting talked about this idea of building a hamlet, you know, a cluster of houses in a maybe near a village, but or at, at a junction or something yep. that were close. Because what I what makes me slightly worried is this idea of chopping up the countryside along roads that lead into villages into one acre lots and having that kind of appearance and that frag fragmentation of the natural, you know, resources where you could still cluster in rural areas and not have one acre lots, but then, you know, and still provide maybe communal septics or communal water or something like that. Right. And, and you may want to deal with it through site plan um, restrictions where you go, well, you can have that, but we're going to make you sit back further off the road or, you know, plant a hedge in front or something so that the person just traveling down the road, they don't get a feel of like, oh, there's a bunch of stuff. Um, or you may want to make, I think it might have been Tim Taylor last night talking about what we call a neighborhood development areas, um, which is, is a state designation, but you, can, you don't need to go that route, where you, a town, typically through a town planning process, would say, we'd like a new node out here. Maybe they even was a historic node out there that had several houses and you know, sewer and water would work and we, we want to build up. Um, so if I think of places like South Bradford, um, 
you know, uh, try to think of some other places in the region where there there is a, you know, there there's several things going on and you could do more, right, instead of just having a strip of more development further and mm-hmm. further and further out. Um, very much so. And all of those tweaks, that's why when we get into each of your towns, there may be a particular spot where where you want a new district um, or you, you really want to say, well, over here we could do this. Um, we did a bunch of work in Bradford on their zoning and figured out that a lot of the lots in the village are really double lots. Um, doable, they have sewer and water um, and they just they just do that way and so they could subdivide dozens of lots in town to put new houses on them um, and kind of meet the current overall pattern out there. Yeah, you're right, uh, Lee. So that's where, um, especially in Stratford and Thetford, where your downtown options are more limited, um, we will be looking, I think, a little harder at the rural areas to what we can do that also meets all those other planning goals about fields, and farms, and forests. Any other questions out there? You see Stephen on the standards, then I'm gonna to go to processes. Nope, nothing else. Um, oh. Kathy shared a, shared a good article. Oh, good. About uh, water infrastructure in towns. All right, wonderful. Um, so besides the standards out there in your bylaw, there's, there's a, a couple of things. There's the applicability of the bylaw to a project. And then there's the, what process do you run them through? And then there's the actual administration of it. So um, maybe you've, you've got a good bylaw and maybe the processes are even fine, but what you really need help with is just how do we use this thing? How do we you know, help applicants? Do we need a cheat sheet ahead of time? Do we need you know, to try to uh, do uh, some towns have like preliminary meetings with applicants just to, to ease the flow, you're not going to bend the rules, but you're just like this stuff is not things that people look at every day. How do you get them from point A to point B as quickly as you can to build the house that you want? Um, and so first off would be exemptions. Don't need a permit from us. Don't have to come here. Off you go. Good luck. Uh, and do we want to be looking at exemptions for certain things? The nice thing about exemptions is there's no appeal. Um, because anybody can appeal anything uh, and clog you up uh, for a while, but if there's no permit, there's no appeal. One of the particular places I, I think that we can start on the, all those with you is um, ADUs inside existing structures. So you know, there's there's virtually no visual change. The ADU is inside the existing structure. The house is there. We're not worried about footprints, and setbacks, and all that type of stuff. Um, why do we care if somebody goes ahead and carves off a one bedroom unit inside their house um, right now? We may say, well, you need a septic permit, but that's over there, that's not in the zoning. Um, we may have some standard and you can have a standard that applies even to exempt uses like, oh, you can go to an ADU um, as long as there's an extra parking space or something, don't need a permit whatever you wanna do in, in those particular things. In the villages, I wouldn't even think about parking. Um, and other some other uses you may say exempt. Changes to existing uh, projects, oftentimes go back through the whole permit, shoots and ladders type of thing. And sometimes those changes can be just like, nope, don't worry about it, or are a straight permit out there. Um, Anything that you've been running through site plan or conditional use and end up always attaching the same rules to, to me, that's an opportunity to just go to a straight permit process and say, these are the rules that apply to those things. Go get a zoning permit. We don't need to review this again. We've seen 10 of these things already. We always say, put the dumpster out back, you know, put the bush in the front. Um, and, and a couple other things like, fine, those are just general conditions for a specific use, just go do it. Site plan approval. Um, in Vermont, there are no required parts of site plan approval. There are common ones that are in there because the statute says you can do this, 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 or anything else you want. 
Um, and people often read that to mean, well, we need to do this, 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 which is not true. But typically in there, what we see uh, is traffic circulation, parking and landscaping. But again, maybe we mean certain things and can show that in a picture or write it down such that you don't have to come and go through a hearing process. You can just be like, yep, met that. The other um, avenue that's not commonly used in the law, but is out there now and has been there for maybe 10 years or so, is that your zoning administrator is empowered, if your bylaw says this, to do basically site plan approval and conditional use. So you can run it to them instead of running it to over here to a body. Um, it's not commonly used, but I think that especially on certain things where you go, yeah, that we don't need to be dealing with, that's small enough or minor enough, um, or we want to be, you know, making it easier to build affordable housing, and we're like, we're just not going to overly uh, chew on that thing. Conditional use approval, and remember, site plan approval and conditional use approval are approvals prior to permits being issued. Conditional use approval is a, is a tougher road to hoe and should be used very sparingly. Site plan approval is for when we're not debating the use. So we don't care that you build a, a multifamily there. We just wanna make sure the parking's right and the sidewalk's right and that type of thing, the things that show up on a site plan. Conditional use approval is much more like, hmm, I don't know if we want multifamily there. Um, and it's really about decisions about, can we condition the use such that it fits in that neighborhood? Uh, and, and I would say we wanna be very judicious how we use that around the housing that we want, because that the conditional use implies that you're not sure you want that use. And in particular, this is where we see uh, multifamily housing in many of our towns being able to go from a conditional use to a site plan approval to maybe even just a permitted use um, because we, we want them. And maybe there's a limit where you go, well, if it's going to be four to six units, we're going to put you through a different process than the, the three to, to four units or something out there. And appeals. Uh, again, if you don't have a permit, you can't appeal it. Um, but appeal processes, how do people go through those appeals, letting them know um, they, they are there for a reason, uh, appeals are, uh, but they can gum up a process, certainly, right now. And then the other part of permit, as I, as I mentioned, is just the administration. How do you actually do this? Do you meet often enough? Uh, are your rules clear? Are there cheat sheets? Do you, can you handhold people through the process? Do you, do you kind of go out and help them do those things um, so that come permit time, everything flows equally? And remember, you know, it's not just your, it's due process is, is due process because it's the constitution, right? Uh, it doesn't matter if you like the person or whatnot, but if you if you don't make rules around it and it's just as easy to build the high-end luxury homes that people are only gonna come to one day a year as it is to build the exact same thing you want, you can't in the permit process go, oh gosh, we wish you wouldn't do that. That is not the time to be doing that. The time to be doing that is when you write the rules, um, not in the permit process, which is, and should never be a popularity contest as I, as I try to, repeat myself, the democracy does not happen in the permit process. The democracy happens in writing the permit process. What you all are gonna be doing with us the next year, that's the democracy, not when developer shows up. And now we're getting near the end, I'm gonna open it wide up for anybody. Um, just to remind folks, so we're, we are gonna be doing a zoning review for each town. We're gonna be doing revisions, which is planned to be three meetings per town. So a pretty condensed process. Uh, we will come to the first meeting with what we call a desk review of your bylaw that essentially is a checklist where we've gone through the bylaw, highlighted all the parts that we think um, we should be touching and put little notes in about, oh, that should be a one, that should be a two, that should be 15. 
you know, this should go up. There's another use in your district. It'll look pretty small, um, but I don't think we're going to generally be building new districts out there because that's a, that's a can get us back into the town plan, which we don't want to go. Um, but it's really going to be around use lists and standards and things like that. And then the idea is we adopt all this. Um, our hope is that you can you can use the interim adoption process, which is fast, um, or you can do the regular adoption process. But that that we we really 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 want this stuff adopted, um, so that it's getting used, so people can go ahead and build stuff. And with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Now I can see you all out there. Um, so. Uh, any questions around the pieces or I didn't mention something or, or, uh, you know, gosh, when can we start? Can't wait. Whatever. Take, take any, any questions you have. We are going to, uh, I am going to be doing a week from today. I'm going to be doing a decisions training too. So, um, if you're on a DRB, especially, um, come to that because that's how one actually issues a decision. Um, the processes you go through, the steps um, to make sure that you're doing that right and how to get it actually out the door and what it contains. Because um, all of those things are not natural unless you are maybe raised by a lawyer like I was. Um, hi, Tim. Tim's joined us, I see. And Kevin, when, um, we have our first question in the chat from Mary, yeah, uh, who great. is asking, in, in our review, uh, will we be making suggestions for future community septic sites for those towns that do not have public septic? No, um, is the short answer on that, because that's really uh, not a zoning issue so much but uh, maybe a town plan or a, or your utility and facilities things, you know, you're gonna be building something. However, um, if you wanna kind of put the cart before the horse, there are place, you might wanna do the zoning first and then work on the septic system afterwards because you could write the zoning bylaw such that, you know, if septic system is available and, and that the answer is constantly no, um, but then, you know, two years down the road, you build it, and now all of a sudden they become class A lots uh, that have sewer. The other um, thing about that is um, we, we may look at soils. There, there are some soil maps and, and it, if it ma matches a district right, we might kind of go, oh, in this district, you know, you really could do more dense stuff um, than what you're doing based on the soils out there. But in general, no. Hey, and then Kathy. Hey, it's Kathy and Wilder again. I had a couple of questions. One was who who would coordinate any eventual zoning reg changes, zoning regulation changes with the state to make sure that statutory regulations are being met after we go through this process, and especially with concern to to especially with concern to town charters as those are being done. Whoa. Um... I, Stephen may have another answer for this. In general, the, did you just pass that football? <laughs> yeah. Well, he he went to law school. I just grew up in law school. Um, the, in general, all, everything that we're doing is pretty much um, standard stuff uh, out there, and so I, I would doubt that you need to go check on your charter. Uh, there are there are going to be some cases where we may be pushing the envelope on what's clearly enabled in Vermont because in Vermont you can't just make up things unless the legislature said you can go make up things uh, like with ADU. Make up things. <laughs> yeah, like with ADUs, they said you know you got to allow this, but have at it um, the rest of the way uh, out there. So so I think that that'll be the way that we do it. I've never had to check a charter on a. Uh, change 
Um, but yeah, I'm just wondering before we go through all the work, if someone, you know, if it turns out like, oh, by the way, the state says you can't do this, I would be like, well, like, Stephen and I, Stephen and I would be kind of in trouble if we wrote some <laughs> wrote something right. that was illegal. Um, <laughs> Um, my other question was, and, and if this is a serious question, why aren't, I mean, I know the answer is money, but why aren't new infrastructure systems being built? I mean, particularly there's a lot of wealthy towns that do not have water and sewer, yet those are considered environmentally better in particular than septic and well. They're more reliable than septic and well. They help with the increasing number of severe storms that we're having due to climate change. And um, you know, it almost seems like an excuse for some towns to say, well, we don't have infrastructure, so we can't do this. And I'm like, I'm kind of tired of hearing that. Like if Hartford yeah. can have infrastructure, you know, maybe someone else can put in some. Yeah, well, and a lot of our infrastructure was built in the 60s and 70s. A lot of our sewer and water infrastructure, well, sewer infrastructure, uh, especially. And now it's getting near the end of their lifespan and people are realizing, oh, there's, there's a big number attached to this. A lot of our water systems are 100 years old out there. And um, they are often a mystery until they fail. Well, believe me, um, we know that in Wilder. <laughs> yeah. And so those, those are big, big numbers. If we had to put a big number on existing infrastructure, not new infrastructure, just fixing stuff you have, um, water systems are, are a giant hole that we can spend all of the ARPA money could just fix existing water systems. Yeah, it just seems like one of those things that keeps getting pushed down the road. And, you know, we're not, I mean, frankly, we're not going to have great housing solutions unless something, unless infrastructure is dealt with. Yeah. And yeah. I think it needs to be dealt with on a more um, level playing field among the towns. Yeah. And that's, I, I'm with you, Kathy, on that. It's, yeah, it's, not, a, it's not a zoning issue. Um, it's really a taxation and, and funding of infrastructure. Well, no, but it relates to our planning and zoning. You know. It does. It does because it, it constrains you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. That's okay. Uh, John, I see it has a question in the chat, which is if we're already working on zoning, when are they raised? And that is an issue I know in some towns um, where you already have one iron in the fire, um, or you may be about to do some other things like Rochester was talking about, maybe working on their zoning. Anyways, that's just mainly going to be um, on our end where we kind of have to say, oh, we're here to operate on the patient's foot. I see the patient's hand is messed up, not our operation. We're just standing on the foot. Um, and, and we have to be careful of that because otherwise we just end up, you know, getting spread way too far and beyond our means. Um, so there'll be places where Stephen and I are gonna be gone, not our zebra, not our zoo. Um, nice thing. Hope you do it. If the parts that you're already working on and our parts get to the process at the same time, then um, taking something through a hearing, you know, doing a hearing notice and that type of thing. If we're doing a hearing notice on change A and cha you're doing change B, it's just one hearing notice. And so we may, there may be ways to, to kind of create some synergy there. Um, but there are some other things, though, just this is not the only, uh, you know, grant and funding in the world. Um, so, for example, there may be um, something that relates to health and walkability. There may be something that relates to energy. Um, there may be something that relates to water where we can pull from one of our other contracts and say, you know what? We can spend a couple hours on that particular thing because we have some other money to do it but otherwise we're probably going to be going that's nice good luck have at it but, but we can't really get into that pickle um i see laurie's hand yeah i uh, i'd like to <clears throat> just respond a little bit to that item john because i uh, there there have been conversations and coordination that we're doing already with Two Rivers because we are getting that other grant that we have to look at the planning uh, section of our town plan, looking at housing. So we've had, even before we apply for the grant applications, both of these, we've had conversations about the overlap and the interplay and how we will be coordinating a lot of that together. 
So if that if your concern was that that you know when we put forth both of these applications, we made that known. I think at our public hearings with the select board or public meeting, to to make sure that we we recognize that there's an overlap and there is a coordination. And in addition to that, because we have membership uh, within the two rivers and we get certain basic services just by virtue of our membership, we're you know that's part of what we're doing. Um, yeah. And if we need to contract with them a little bit separately to help us do mapping and that kind of stuff, we've also talked about that. So there's a there's a there's a, a process that I think these things will work well hand in hand. If that was the the concern you had. Yeah, well, actually, actually, Lori, I was uh, also thinking about the climate action plan, which mm -hmm. I'm involved with the implementation of, and there are <clears throat> a laundry list of zoning items to be considered in implementing the climate action plan. And having watched how mm, long and drawn out changing any zoning provision is, the more we can combine uh, these various mm, zoning considerations, the better off we'll all be from a time point of view. Right, yeah. and, I, and I understand that. And I, I think part of what maybe we touched on a little bit yesterday too, is that there is overlap between affordability and a lot of the recommendations that uh, to affect climate change as well and access to transportation that if I'm not wrong, Ke uh, Kevin, you would be looking at the proximity of these things in relationship to tran good transportation systems. Um, also uh, encouraging regulations to take into consideration issues of um, affordability relative to energy efficiency improvements and so forth. Maybe you could speak to that, Kevin. Right. I mean, so for example, and Hartford's a little bit of a, it's individual case, but if somebody were to propose um, a larger residential development or even a mixed use with a large residential component development that wasn't near a transit stop, you might have a standard in your bylaw that says, you know, if you're not within a thousand feet of another transit stop as part of your project under site plan review, we're going to be looking because you're going to be building a transit stop. Um, even if the transit doesn't yet park there. Um, so there, there could be something like that. Uh, Stephen works on energy stuff um, over in the region and we have some money this year or we may not have money next year from the legislature, but who knows, maybe we'll get some climate money. Um, and so we have a little grab bag of odds and ends around energy that it may be relatively easy to, to stick in uh, mostly around commercial uh, structures. Um, and so there, again, there may be a spot where we can go, you know, like while we're here, we can, we can do that, but we can't have like three meetings about that provision. Uh, we can, we can just say, oh, here's a little fix. You guys good, good, go. And just, just to add a little bit to that, um, I think more to what kind of what you're getting at is that we're the focus is on housing, but it, it has all these different spokes and that went in that went into this project from from the get go um, before the application process. We really uh, we looked at even the, the districts and how we're we didn't just go to Google Maps and say what's within a mile of uh, where Google lab Google Maps lands in Hartford. Um, we actually looked at the districts and, and kind of considered that, you know, kind of the cutoff for, for, for what we were gonna, the zones that we were really trying to look at. Um, and they're all a little bit different, but, uh, and then the, the reality of this is just seven of the 30 towns. Um, I mean, we, we continue to hope that not only with these seven towns will lead the way for the other 30, much like you, you all have in the energy and transportation and other areas uh, that this program will actually this project will will lead into the other 23 being involved eventually as well. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Sure thing, John. Yeah. And that's a lot of it. Um, I think we'll, we will try to coordinate behind the scenes so that the public doesn't get confused about, wait a minute, you know, are there three things going on that I have to watch? Well, it's like, no, it's just one thing. We're, we're connecting it all back here. Other questions or comments? 
it's 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 gonna be uh you know it'll be pretty fast from our side and pretty surgical um as far as what we're doing in there if we see something that you know just makes our hair curl um because we go like whoa that's you you know your discontinuance clause is really strange or you know you don't have anything about nonconformities or or any of those other you know weedy things that us zoning people look at we may go you know here's a nonconformity provision um just you know and drop it in um, and that type of stuff typically definitions are going to get all run through um to try to make sure that we mean what you say and that it's workable out there i see kathy again do we have anybody else uh oh and i see uh uh, uh something yeah. in the chat chat too. I just so, I have a question, but I defer yeah. to the person who hasn't spoken yet. So please go well, ahead. Let me, let me look at the, the chat. Um, says, what's the best way for housing and service organizations to participate in this process if it's unreasonable to expect attendance at all meetings? Um, yeah, again, the plan is three meetings per town, but you know, that's hours and hours of sitting there and waiting for your thing to come up. I would, I would defer to all of you as well. But in general, if you can give somebody a written comment about the exact thing that you'd like, you know, I'd like this provision, or I'd like that provision changed, or this bothers me, do something about it. Um, the best, the better that is. And come adoption time, um, there's bound to be somebody who doesn't like what we're going to be doing, and to show up and go, we like this thing you know adopt this select board because it's it's not a mystery for those of you who do local politics you know when you get a select board meeting if there's two angry people there and there's no happy people select board's like i don't know this could be the end of the world um whereas if there's two angry people and five happy people they go yeah i just got two angry people keep going uh, so it's it's really critical when we get at the end of the road uh, that that you do have support and so the housing and service organizations that are thinking about this stuff all the time, um, and maybe churches, we had two churches last night who are dealing with this stuff nonstop because people are coming to them with their issues um, to have them show up and go, this is what we need to do. You know, you guys have done the technical work, but really this is a moral thing. Um, make this thing happen. So that's my answer to RACDC. Uh, but Kathy, you have a question. I have so many questions, <laughs> but I'm not going to monopolize. I don't see hands go up. I'm like, oh, I'll ask again. Okay, so two things I wonder about. I have always wondered why planning and zoning are separate in towns that have both, because I learned belatedly as a civilian who was involved in an appeal once. Um, I, you know, as someone else has said, there's so many moving parts to all of this that, you know, did I know that you had to appeal zoning and or planning as separate entities? And, um, you know, without sounding, I don't want to sound negative. I want to seem very positive about this, but as an experience in the past, um, it seems hard to let the individual, it seems like the system is not set up to let the individual who lives in a neighborhood or something like that um, address some issues with some of their commissions or God forbid, if they go to an appeal an appeal, I mean, you, with apologies to anybody here with a JD, oh. we are like, we, there are so many lawyers involved in all of this stuff with every group. And it's not really set. The system's not really set up, I think, to let individuals or to help individuals or to be proactive to individuals who are trying to do something, um, either with their own place or, you know, in, I'm trying to think of a polite way to say this, or in addressing issues they see coming up with um, developers, and that includes nonprofits. Yeah, it, well, and that's a, on a project by project level, I would say there is enormous opportunity for people to take part in the de making of the rules. You know, all, the, our, all your meetings are public and and stuff. Although sometimes people go, well, I didn't get a, you know, I didn't get a postcard telling me to come to the meeting tonight. And you go, well, the, you know, the planning commission just posted on the wall, like come to the meetings. Oh yeah. Uh, I hear that. Yeah. The, the, 
there is an approachability issue in the whole field, I think, which is sometimes like, what does that thing mean? You know, how are you writing it? And so how is the, the bylaw or the plan actually written so that it's just understandable? Um, and, you know, again, the plans and bylaws by law are, are separate projects. As far as people go, though, like in a Hartford, Lori's both hats. Um, we're always writing both things on our on our uh, planning commissions, write both sets of plans and bylaws. So it's, it's pretty much the same people. I mean, with the, with the planning commission, like we have a planning commission and we have a zoning board of adjustment. Yes. And those are different rules and regs that, you know, God forbid there is an appeal, have to be addressed separately. And I've often wondered Correct. why, as we have a planning and zoning department, why are these often separate entities in towns? It's just that's the way the law is. Um, in many towns, they're the same people and they have to remember just like, wait, we're not the planning commission tonight. We're the zoning board of adjustment. We have to switch hats. Um, but yeah, the law is just set up that way uh, for, for towns. Yeah, I, I, you know, and you know, one example of this that's pretty basic, but it's not at all basic when you get into it is, you know, when you read ordinances, when you read, you know, stuff from the environmental court, you will hear, this is such a Vermont thing, um, you will read about character and adverse effect. Okay, you will not find a definition of either one of those two things. And I mentioned that to a lawyer who used to work with the ANR once, and their response was, yeah, that's job security for lawyers. Well, <laughs> and those are the kinds of things, though, that I would like to see defined more specifically as we move forward, because I think it would spell that kind of stuff out for both developers and the people who are going to these meetings as members of the public. Yeah, and... And and Stephen and I, we, you know, that's when we're in the definitions. We'll try to go. Oh, that needs to define. Um, there is a limit to that, you know, which is kind of like Webster's dictionary is over there. Um, for oh yeah, for it does the, not cover those two. <laughs> for all those things, and and there's kind of a prudence test in the law, which is what would just a reasonable per person reading this thing do? That's that's what the law means. Uh, but there are places where you know, like especially setbacks where you go to the building and and there we can really get into drip edge footprint disturbed area shadow there are all sorts of ways to go this is actually the edge so everybody can know that's the edge of the building that we're I mean, talking about if i can just wrap up my feedback i would look i would ask that as we go forward there are more defined um examples of or clearer definitions for things like character, adverse effect, and the all famous Queechee test. Um, you know, because those are the things that people are addressing when they tend to feel like they want to do an appeal or, you know, well, something coming before a board. Because yes. it's like affordable. When you say affordable housing, there's no definition. Well, actually, there, there is there is a definition. There's a statutory definition. For affordable of affordable housing. as that sure. word itself? Oh, yeah. Of affordable housing. Um, in Vermont? In Vermont, yeah. Oh, I would love to know what that is. Yeah, and, and it's based upon the area median income as set by HUD for the county and stuff. It's not, um, to me, necessarily where we want to be operating in terms of missing middle housing. And so that's why that particular thing, like if you're giving a, uh, a bonus or an incentive for affordable housing, you better define it or send it to the statute or, or well, as an example like we've seen people talk about affordable housing and it hasn't been specifically affordable housing you i have found that you have to go and say what of this is affordable housing what of this is 80 to 120 percent market rate housing it will it has not in my experience been brought forward by people at these meetings first well we, we, we will be discussing all of those good things. thank you yeah lee um the point that I was trying to address has, has passed quite a long time ago in your, in your back and forth. But That's what okay. I was trying to say was that the planning commission, at least in Thetford, writes the plans, writes the town plan, writes the zoning regulations that interpret the town plan. And then it's the development review board that actually puts, interprets that and actually hears the cases and 
uh, says, yes, you know, these are the zoning regs and we think that the zoning reg, this applies to this, but you know, your project is, is not um, covered by this kind of thing. So if anyone wants to appeal anything, I'd say you go to the DRB, the planning commission is not in, is not involved in the execution of any of the things. Right. But, but, involved if you do well, it. Kathy, appeal. Kathy, Kathy we, we're not going to get in the back and forth. Um, so, uh, Yes, you're you're right in that the the depending upon towns. Now, in some towns that don't have DRBs, planning commissions still perform um, a quasi judicial review function. But you're you're right in that. Um, and in Act Two Hundred and Fifty, different ballgame planning commissions or parties. But in street zoning, yeah, it's it's the DRB or the zoning administrator. And we're we're going to talk about that next week in, in decisions a lot which is who should be weighing in on these things and who shouldn't be. And don't be asking the select board member a question when you're pumping gas about whether you need a permit and that type of thing, because um, those, those things can, can cause you grief uh, trying to be nice to your neighbor. Mm -hmm. We're pushing against the limit here. Um, again, each town's gonna be its own little custom fit, um, but there's gonna be a bunch of what I call kind of Lego that may fit from town to town. And, um, and if process is an issue, come next week and we'll talk process. Anything else you have, Stephen? Uh, no. Oh, good. Well, we're looking forward to this. Um, again, it's, you know, for most of your bylaws, it's going to be like 100 words or less, um, but they're going to be 100 important words. Okay, somebody found that funny. Um, all righty. Well, with that, uh, we're going to stop the recording and we'll see you all uh, sometime in the near recording future. Recording stopped. If I end, will that end it for everybody? Oh, I don't want uh, It will. Oh, I'll it's wait. Not. I won't just. <laughs> I find it slightly psychically disconcerting when I'm kind of like sucked into or out of zone. Yeah. Okay, now. There right. might be people just eating dinner now. Yeah, <laughs> now, now I'm going to end it. Okay, see ya. See ya.